Good evening. Thank you, uh, everyone, for tuning in. I um, hope you enjoy this. So, using the uh, 1939 register, recording the UK population before the war. It looks a lot like a census. It was taken by an army of enumerators who delivered forms to every household and then who collected them and wrote them up into enumeration books. It was organised by the General Register Office, who had been um, taking censuses every 10 years since 1841, so they had a pretty good idea of how that worked. But there are a couple of very important differences between this 1939 register and the censuses that we're all used to looking at. First of all, a census is about the bigger picture. It's about gathering statistics and finding out about the country as a whole. And the best way of doing that is to list everybody. And if you miss a few people out, that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for genealogists a few years later. But from the point of view of the census taking, um, it doesn't matter too much because you still get the, uh, the, the statistics and the information that you're looking for. The 1939 register was very different because the whole object of the exercise was to record every individual and get the details about them. There were statistics produced as a result, but that was the byproduct. The object was to record every single person um, in the UK. Now, the survey was done over the whole of England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland and the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. But the records that we're dealing with here are only for England and Wales. Those are the ones which have uh, recently been released online. And um, these are the only ones that you'll be able to look at. Now, the planning had been going on for quite a long time. This is a, a circular sent around by the General Register Office uh, to do with the planning. This is dated 1938. And it actually deals with both the 1939 register and the 1941 census. Because when, the, when this was being planned, there was still a possibility that the 1941 census would be taken as normal. Um, if there had been no war, obviously, there would have been no register taken and the 1941 would have gone ahead. If it had been a very short war and it was all over, then the 1941 would have been taken as well as the National Register. In the event, of course, we know that there was only the National Register and that the 1941 census was never taken. And the 1939 register, although it's not a census, it's a very good census substitute and it fills a very big gap because we can look at the 1911 census. And in January 2022, we'll be able to look at the 1921 census. But after that, for England and Wales, there's a great big gap until 1951, because unfortunately, the 1931 census for England and Wales was destroyed in a fire during the Second World War. So for, uh, for England and Wales only, 1939 is a particularly good gap filler. Now, it was being planned in, in tandem with the 1941 census, which didn't take place. Um, and it was being organised as usual for a census by the um, army of local registrars and the enumerators that they recruited. There is a little bit of a difference, though, because we're used to the census being taken on the same lines as birth, marriage and death registration districts. And while this was the case up to a point in 1939, because the object of this was to record every individual for getting them identity cards and ration books, and then later on for uh, conscripting people into the armed forces, the administration of all the, the, uh, the, the food, rationing, and the um, conscription, that was going to be done on a local authority basis. So the boundaries are slightly different. So they're, they're not always going to be the ones that you expect if you become very familiar with census boundaries. And this is just the beginning of a very long list of area codes covering England and Wales, which you might find helpful. Uh, every area had a code of a three letter code starting at AAA in the city of London, going all the way up to Z uh, in North Wales. This whole list, and there are over 1400 of them, this whole list is actually online on Find My Past website. And I have got a link to that and to various other things in the notes that accompany the webinar. So if you really want to look at the, the whole list, um, you, you can do. Um, this is the 
shed the household schedule that was uh, delivered to every household before registration night. Uh, registration night was the 29th of September 1939. If you're familiar with 1911 household schedules, you'll see that this is a, a, a much smaller document. There are far fewer columns. Um, but the information that was gathered uh, was still quite important for family historians. First of all, for each household, you had the, each person's full name and then their exact date of birth, their marital status, and then quite a lot of information about their occupation. Unfortunately, you don't get relationships within the household and you don't get places of birth because these were not really relevant to the, the object of the exercise. So from the genealogist's point of view, that's a shame, but there was no reason uh, to record that at the time. And it was very important to get the relevant information as quickly as possible because this all had to be done very, very fast uh, once war was declared. The information about occupations is quite interesting because everyone was asked not only for their current occupation, but also if they were doing any supplementary duties. But for example, people might already have volunteered to be uh, ARP wardens or fire watchers, and that was information was asked for. And they were also asked if they had any other occupational skills, if there was something you were qualified in or suited to that you weren't actually pursuing as your occupation at the moment, but which might be useful for the war effort. That was um, quite important from the point of view of planning. So that was, uh, that was all asked for. And on the reverse of the schedule, you can see the fairly detailed instructions. And again, there was a very great deal on there to do with the recording of occupations, because um, this was going to be used for uh, direction of labour uh, as well as conscription and ration and identity cards. Some occupations, of course, were reserved occupations, things like coal mining and shipbuilding, so that people who were in those occupations wouldn't be uh, called up for military service. This is a very useful website. It's called Online Historical Population Reports, and it's known as HISTPOP for short. And the, the few documents I've already shown you, they, you, you can find all of those on this website. Um, there's a tremendous amount of background information here about um, census and registration uh, and, a, and a lot more besides. Um, and there are lots of scans of documents and lots of information about them. Um, you can look at this website, you can search by keyword, but I'd recommend that you browse uh, by subject. And if you look at the menu on the left here, the subject area that you want to look at to find out lots of background about national registration in 1939 and also in 1915, because it had already been tried once. Um, you will find that under TNA registration. And then there are three pages of interesting looking uh, sets of documents there. And the stuff to do with national registration is on the second and third pages. And there's quite a lot there to look at. There's a lot more besides that hasn't been scanned and put on this website and that still only exists in documents here in the National Archives. But there's certainly enough there to give you um, quite a, a good background uh, to what went into national registration um, and uh, what they, how they learned from the 1915 experience. This um, had been tried because in 1915, they were running out of recruits into the armed forces. So conscription was going to have to be introduced. And of course, you can't have conscription unless you've got a fairly decent register of the available people. But the 1915 attempt at registration uh, only listed adults. Um, and although it was uh, taken by the General Register Office, who were very good at doing a, a census, the, uh, the snapshot in time, where everybody's standing when the music stops, what they had no experience of was managing um, a register that was having to be constantly updated. And there was a report written at the time uh, by a man called Sylvanus Vivian, who was, uh, worked in national insurance, who was saying that what he thought was going to work and what he thought wasn't going to work based on his experience of uh, national insurance, which was um, constantly having to be updated. Little did he know that a generation on, he was going to be the Registrar General, who was in charge of organising national registration. And um, his experience in, uh, in, in both of those areas um, came in very handy indeed. So one of the reasons that national registration and rationing and identity cards worked remarkably well in the Second World War was because it had been tried out in the First World War. And they had learnt uh, from, uh, from 
their mistakes. Now, this is a building which some of you might recognise. This is Smedley Hydro in Southport. This was where um, the General Register Office was evacuated at the beginning of the Second World War to get the staff and the records safely out of London. A lot of government departments were moved to sites in safer areas. Um, the Smedley Hydro had been a, a sort of spa resort and a hotel. It's a, it's a very elegant building. And in fact, the, the General Registry Office kept this building on after the war. Um, if you order a birth, marriage or death certificate from the General Registry Office, this is where it will be produced. This is the, the home of their certificate production. And this was the home of the, the National Register uh, from 1939 when it was compiled. And um, right on up until 1991, because national registration, which was brought in for the wartime, carried on for a while afterwards, wasn't finally wound up until 1952. But in 1948, the National Health Service um, had been set up, and that also needed a detailed national register. And it made an awful lot of sense to use an existing register, which was the national register. So for, there was an overlap of four years between 1948 and 1952 when two different organisations were using the same register. And they were updating it. And this is um, the, the crucial thing about this register. It started off looking like a census um, of where everybody was and their ages, and, and their dates of birth and their occupations in September 1939. But it was constantly being updated manually um, right up until the 1990s when the National Health Service started putting its records onto computer and the paper records eventually weren't required anymore. There was a long handover period when they had to keep the, um, the paper registers going to sort out any queries in the online service, but eventually they were, they were packed away. Um, when they were still in use, they were in one of the rather grand rooms in Smedley Hydro, which was called the ballroom because that's exactly what it was. And it's a magnificent room, and it never really looked at its best when it was full of metal shelving with lots of books on it. Um, and once the register was no longer required, uh, it was all packed away. And this is uh, a shot of the basement at Smedley Hydro, and, uh, which at the time was also used as an air raid shelter. And that's where the General Register Office still store um, documents and books and registers uh, that aren't required to be looked at on a, on a daily basis. And that um, is where the, uh, the, the National Health Service Register, as it became, was uh, eventually packed away. Now, when the register was being taken, um, there was a lot of publicity, as you'd expect, as there always is when there is a census. Um, there were posters all over the place. There were notices in the newspapers. And there, was, um, uh, there were radio broadcasts. And one of those, in fact, was the Registrar General, Mr. Silvanus Vivian, um, he recorded, uh, he made a broadcast to the nation on uh, the, the BBC Home Service on registration night. And uh, we found the script of that broadcast in a document here at the National Archives. And we actually had it recorded uh, by an actor so that you, you could go onto our website and you can actually hear what the Registrar General had to say to the nation uh, on registration night. And he was reassuring everyone that the forms would be really. Uh, perfectly simple for them to fill in and how important it was that they did it uh, correctly and invited the enumerator in uh, when he or she came to collect the forms and issue everyone's identity cards. And this was something again which makes it unlike a census. Instead of just going to each household and collecting the forms and taking them away, the enumerator had to go in and sit down with the household and check through all the forms and make sure that everything was in order and there and then write out an identity card for every single person in that household. So that was an awful lot of work, and it was a lot more than the, the census enumerators had to do in a normal census year. And once he'd done all of that, um, he or she, there were quite a, quite a number of female enumerators, had to take the household schedules that they'd collected, to take them home and write them up into enumeration books. And these are the ones that became this 1939 register that we're going to be looking at. Um, the original household schedules were sent on to the local food officers who used them to prepare ration books. And the local, the local national registration officers, which sounds like a confusing title, uh, but the local national registration officers 
they compiled their own index cards from those household schedules as well. So when we talk about the national register, um, we're actually talking about a lot of separate registers. And this um, set of enumeration books that were compiled following this enumeration um, at September 1939, that was the, the core of it, but that was only just part of a massive national system of keeping tabs on the whole population. Now, who is in this 1939 register? Well, in theory, it should be every civilian who was in England and Wales on the 29th of September 1939. And that would be regardless of their age or their nationality. Uh, unlike the First World War, every single person from newborn babies up to the you know, to centenarians was supposed to be recorded because, of course, no matter where you came from or what your age was, you were still going to need a ration book and when you were old enough to be responsible for carrying it around, an identity card as well. And it was very important to carry your card at all times because you could be required to produce it by um, a policeman or various other authority figures and people could, um, could be prosecuted for not having their um, identity card with them. Foreign visitors, including embassy and consular staff, uh, were also included because, again, they still needed to get their, their rations and to prove who they were. Inmates of institutions of every kind, whether they were hospitals, prisons, every kind of institution except military barracks because the military were enumerated separately. Um, but civilians who were on the military bases, they were included in the 1939 register. And anybody who was away from home, away from their normal home address, they were, would be enumerated and listed wherever they happened to be on census night, sorry, on registration night. Uh, so if they were in a hotel or staying in someone else's home, or if they were um, on the road somewhere, they would still be registered where they were on registration night and would have to um, keep the, the registration authorities notified of any change of address, which included going back to your normal home. And uh, the big group of people that would be included in this away from the normal home is evacuees. Because war was declared at the beginning of September, and immediately school children and other vulnerable groups, very young preschool children um, and their mothers, pregnant women and um, disabled people, as well as, uh, as of course, the uh, people working in government departments, which had been moved for, for safety to um, locations away from London and big cities. So a lot of people were away from where, from their home addresses where you might normally expect to find them. And of course there were people who were travelling, who travelled as part of their work, travelling salesmen and so forth, and seasonal workers. And another very big group here was uh, hop pickers. A lot of people from the East End of London went to Kent every year to spend the summer earning some money doing hop picking. And although very large numbers of them had gone back to London, um, very large numbers were still in Kent, and if you search by occupation for hop picker, you will find a, a lots and lots of people um, of that occupation, which you can only really carry out um, in rural areas anyway. You'll still find that a lot of them were in Kent, so um, if you were expecting somebody to be in Stepney or Bethnal Green um, and you can't find them there, they might well still be in a, in a field somewhere near Tunbridge Wells um, doing uh, their, their hop picking. And this is uh, an example. This is a picture from a Nottingham newspaper on registration night, just showing how um, even people that you might think would easily fall through the net, um, the regular 150 lodgers at the Salvation Army Hospital in Nottingham, here they are being having their information recorded um, by a Salvation Army officer um, for registration. There were very, very detailed instructions to the registrars and to the enumerators about making sure that they um, got everybody. People who were um, working overnight on shift work, um, they were to be enumerated at their home addresses where they were going to be on the, the next morning. Anyone who was traveling um, overnight should be enumerated at their, their destination um, where they would be on the next morning. And uh, But people who were in tents and caravans who were uh, travelers um, on people in fairgrounds, anyone at all who was on the move and had temporarily lodged somewhere. There were quite complicated in, in instructions just designed to make sure that everybody was enumerated somewhere. There were all kinds of local difficulties when you've got 
people who were on river barges and who had to go because the tide uh, required that they went. Um, but there were provisions that for um, forms to be collected by um, an enumerator, even if it wasn't the person who'd um, issued the form in the first place. So a lot of trouble was taken to make sure that everybody um, should be registered. But not everybody, of course, is going to be in this register that you might hope to find. First of all, anybody who was outside England and Wales on that date, even temporarily, they would not be in the England and Wales register. If they were just across the border in Scotland, they might be in that if they were in Ireland. Um, but if they were just outside the country, um, coming back from the continent or some other country, when they arrived back um, in England and Wales, they would be registered, but they wouldn't be in this 1939 enumeration. Members of the armed forces um, who were already in active, in active service in the armed forces, they wouldn't be included in the register because the military and naval authorities uh, were in charge of um, providing them with their identity cards and their rations. The exceptions to this are people who are at, at home on leave from the army or the navy. Um, and there are quite a number of those. Um, and it's worth remembering that although most of us have got family members who served in the first in the Second World War, those who were conscripted, they weren't starting to be called up until 1940 because you couldn't start conscripting people unless you had a list to um, consult, and this was the list. So some people were already in the forces if they were regular soldiers and sailors who were already in service. And if they were reserves, they may have already been called up straight away. Uh, but you will still find some who are at home on leave, um, who, who are waiting to be, who are expecting to be called up. Merchant Navy personnel, they're always very tricky when it comes to enumerating them in censuses, um, partly because they're very mobile and people who are very mobile are always very tricky uh, to, to, to pin down because uh, they're not in one place for long enough. So, again, the Merchant Navy had its own arrangements for providing identity cards and ration books uh, and their own system of registration. But again, people who were normally in the merchant service, but who were at home and between voyages, you would find them recorded with all the civilians. And people that you might sometimes class as Merchant Navy, people like fishermen who were based on land and who just went out um, on short trips and on you know, just for one day or one night, you would expect them to be uh, enumerated with the civilian population. But it is always complicated when you've got uh, people who are only living on boats. Anyone born after the 29th of September would be registered separately in um, a new register, which was not surprisingly called the birth register. And anyone who arrived, who was late uh, in registering for any reason, would be in, um, a, a, again, a separate register along with people who arrived back in the country uh, from overseas or foreigners who are arriving for the first time. And it's very difficult to work out at what point um, people were too late to be in the registers that we are going to be able to see. Because as far as the national registration authorities were concerned, everybody was going to be registered. And you started with all the people that you could round up on the 29th of September, and then everybody who, who appeared after that, they would be in some book or other, and the, the registration authorities had access to all the books. So provided they got everybody, ideally sooner rather than later, provided they got everybody, that was what mattered. And it didn't matter so much as whether they were in this original set of books or in one of the continuation ones. So I haven't yet been able to find an actual date beyond which people wouldn't go into the, this um, one-off enumeration. And it may be that there was no such date uh, because registration was a continuous process. But if you can't find somebody, that might be the, um, the reason. Uh, despite the best efforts of the authorities and of all the enumerators, no matter how many times they went back to an address, they might still not find somebody who was in, or somebody might have moved and in the confusion um, you know, there was a war on after all, and there was a lot of confusion about. Um, there were people who still managed not to get their forms uh, returned to an enumerator um, in a timely fashion. And of course, there were always going to be a small number of people 
who deliberately avoided being registered. Um, certainly a good reason for that would be people who wanted to avoid being conscripted or in many cases, the mothers of young men who didn't want their sons to be conscripted. Uh, and they might also be tempted to lie about their ages as well. That was a relatively small number of people. Um, and the, virtually everybody did get registered uh, sooner or later. But there was a very small number who managed to avoid it altogether one way and another. And um, also a small number who completely refused to register. Who they were had a principled objection. They were conscientious objectors. Um, or in the case of one, one lady uh, who refused to believe that there was a war on at all and that the blackout was just a result of the inefficiency of the electricity supply companies. And uh, some people were um, eventually prosecuted for refusing to provide information. So um, that's extremely bad luck if uh, the person you want is one of those uh, that they were. Now, when you get to look at the records, not all of them are open. Because the register is not a census, it's not covered by the terms of the 1920 Census Act, which has a very strict 100-year closure period on um, the entirety of the records. It was taken under its own 1939 Register Act. And that act was challenged under freedom of information. Uh, and for quite a while now, you've been able to request extracts, just transcripts, from the register for England and Wales, also for Scotland or for Northern Ireland, provided you could um, supply enough information to identify a person. Now that the England and Wales records have been digitised, um, closure periods still apply. And anyone who was born less than 100 years ago, their records should be closed because they are uh, potentially, they could still be alive. And if they are, if somebody was born more recently than that, then if they've since died and the register has been updated with details of their death, then their record should be open. Now, in theory, the register was updated, first of all, as the National Registration um, Register, and then later than that, as the National Health Service Register. But it was still being manually updated up to 1991. That's the theory. Unfortunately, not every death uh, was notified to the registration authorities during that time. Up to 1952, while national registration was still in force, it was a legal requirement to notify every change of address, every change of name, and if someone died, their um, a notification of their death and their identity cards and ration books uh, were supposed to be handed in. In practice, of course, this didn't always happen. Some people would die outside of um, the United Kingdom, in which case there would be no reason at all to notify the National Health Service. Um, and there were cases where if some, someone died, but the paperwork just didn't get forwarded to the National Health Service, and they remained on, uh, on, on the register even though they, they had died. Um, anyone who was in the army and who died during the war, they would be removed from this register because they were now part of the armed forces. Um, so if they died on war service, there would be no reason to notify the National Register because they weren't part of it. So there are an awful lot of deaths that you might expect to be recorded in the register, and unfortunately they're not. Having said that, there are still an awful lot of people in it, and anybody who was born over 100 years ago, that means anybody who was 24 and upwards in 1939, so that's an awful lot of people. This is the page on Find My Past, which is where you can view the records. Uh, now, it's a commercial site, so you have to pay to look at the records. Although, if you come here to the National Archives, because these are now National Archives records, access here is completely free. So if you're now reading them, you can look at as many uh, records as you like, and there is no charge for it. I'm not going to say a lot very much about the searching, because there is a huge amount of information on the Find My Past website, all about how to search and um, a lot of the search tips and tricks. Uh, there is also some information about that in our own guide. Again, all of these links are on the document that I've provided. This is just the, the basic search, which you can use, um, where you could put in minimal information. But there is also an advanced search, and it's always worth looking at an advanced search to see what options you have. You can search by exact date of birth, which can be extremely useful. 
and uh, you can search by occupation and you can filter your search by all sorts of means. You can search for um, the name of another person that you expect to be in the household. So there is an awful lot that you can do with the advanced search. Um, but as with any online service, less is more. It's always a good idea to put in minimum amount of information um, because the more information you put in and the more exact it is, the more chances you give the database to disagree with what you've said. So um, there will be transcription errors and there are certainly errors in the original record. And um, if what the enumerator wrote down is wrong, then that stands. Um, so there are all sorts of reasons why putting in a, a, very, a lot of detail that you know to be true won't necessarily find the person that you want. So it's always a good idea to try lots of uh, different tactics. When you do a search, you, you get a free preview with fairly minimal information, and you can you then decide whether or not you want to look at the full record, in which case you'll then get um, a transcription of the, the open records that are within that household um, and, the, and an indication of how many closed records there are. And uh, you will also be able to look at the image. And the image is of the whole page, not just of the household that you're interested in looking at. And uh, if the household that uh, you've been searching for happens to span two pages, you can also look at the, uh, at the, the other page uh, for no extra charge. And as I said, if you're here at the National Archives, you can, uh, uh, you can sit and look at all these records to your heart's content for, for no charge. Um, this is, um, at last, an example of what one of the pages looks like. There's no such thing as a typical page, but this one is as good an example uh, of what to expect uh, as any other one. Now, what you'll see here, first of all, is that this is the left-hand page of um, an opened pair of pages. And you'll see that you've got the whole of the left-hand page and a column from the right-hand page. Now, the rest of the right-hand the right -hand page, you won't be able to see that. That's completely closed. That's um, a bit of the book that was used by the health service and it was updated um, until the records went onto computer with lots of health information, a lot of which is uh, confidential and um, potentially very sensitive. And we're never going to see that. We don't have the original books here at the National Archives. They are they're still um, locked away by the health service. What we have is a digital only accession, which is the digital images of these left hand pages and a bit of the right hand page. The black lines are where a particular record is closed, and that means that that person was born less than 100 years ago and um, they're either still alive or their death hasn't been notified to the National Health Service or so far to um, ourselves and Find My Past. Now, the good news here is that more and more records are going to be opened uh, as time goes on. When the records were released on the 2nd of November 2015, about 28 million out of the total 41 million were open. But more and more will be opened, first of all, as each uh, person passes um, the, the 100 year mark. And then um, if you've identified a record that you know who that person is likely to be and you can prove their death, you've got a copy of their death certificate, you can submit that, um, a, a copy of the death certificate, and then um, if, if it is the person that you um, were expecting it to be, then that record will be opened. So if you do a search today, you will find a certain number of closed records. If you do exactly the same search in a week's time, in a month's time, in a year, five years, you will find a lot more open records, hopefully, on the same page. So more and more records will be opened. And there is a facility on the, uh, the full transcription when you want to find my past to request a record to be opened where you can provide proof of that person's death. And there's also a facility to request a record be closed if it's open and you think it should be closed. So that's an example of a page that's got uh, some of the usual elements. You can see uh, the information that's come from the household schedules. You've got the address, uh, you've got each person's name, date of birth and their occupation, and in some, time, some cases quite a lot of detail. And on this um, column, the, the, the right-hand page, that's where you'll get details about people who are ARP wardens, ambulance drivers, fire watchers, and those sort of things, or in the uh, who are in reserves in the, the armed forces uh, but aren't obviously as yet on active service. 
Now you also see lots of updates. Some of the updates will be put on the bits of the page that we can't see. You have to bear in mind that these books were used over about 50 years by um, various generations of civil servants doing updates for a whole lot of different reasons and they are not going to be consistent because every few years somebody will change their minds about what needs to be done and the best way of doing it. One of the results of this is that we have all sorts of little intriguing updates and annotations on the bits that we can see. And most of the time, we don't know what these annotations mean. A lot of the time, you can make a very educated guess. And the one that you can almost always work out is where a surname has been crossed out and another surname is written in. And this is because changes of name were recorded. And this is, in most cases, it's women who change their name on marriage. But there are lots of other reasons for changes of name. It can be um, people who were adopted and had their name changed, and also people who just changed their name by deed poll. And in a few cases where a name's been written wrongly and it's a correction. Sometimes you'll see that where this has been done and it will be accompanied by a date. And when you look that up, that turns out to be fairly close to the date of marriage. Um, when you see a date, that's the date that the register was notified. So in the case of a marriage, it's very likely to be a few days or a couple of weeks later. But it should be there or thereabouts. But there are an awful lot of little annotations on there that we don't know what they are. We haven't been supplied with um, a list of codes. Sometimes um, it's likely to be the serial number of a particular form that was used for a particular kind of update. Uh, but there's no um, easy way of identifying it. Mostly, we just have to take the information at face value. This is the information as it stood on September 1939 and with changes of name and sometimes updates to occupation. You don't usually see the information that somebody has died um, that was recorded, on, usually on the bit that you can't see. Uh, but we have, uh, but we in Find My Past were supplied with a list of the names where a death a D code, which is uh, the, the indication that someone had died. Um, they were issued with a list of those. Uh, so that's why some of the records were of, of people born less than 100 years ago were um, visible and open on launch. There is an intriguing one that you'll see quite often that says, see page something else. And um, sometimes if you're really lucky, you can find that by doing a reference search, changing the page number. Uh, but frankly, it doesn't work particularly well. Um, one thing you'll notice is that the pages aren't actually numbered. So it's not always going to be very clear what they mean by page 13 or page 20. Um, the ones where we've been able to find the other entry, it usually is just exactly the same information. But again, we don't know exactly why the same person appears twice, but they usually have exactly the same details and the same registration number. So it's usually something that would have made perfect sense at the time. Somebody ran out of space, wanted to make a correction. Uh, but it's one of those questions that we're going to be asked all the time, and I'm afraid we don't know the answer, and we probably never will. Although now that there are hundreds of thousands of pairs of eyes looking all over this, who knows what educated guesses people will be able to come up with, wisdom of crowds and all that. So that's an example of the sort of thing that you're likely to see. That's the top half of the page. Bottom half of the page is also a good illustration of things that you're likely to see which is that because these things were in constant use and being handled all the time, they got torn and they got damaged and they got mended with sellotape, which um, it, well, you wouldn't do that to a, a valuable historical document. Our collection care department felt absolutely crazy at that. But unfortunately, this is what happened to this. It was a working document. You did the best you could. And um, the unfortunate thing about sellotape, of course, is it leaves a nice murky brown mark. And sometimes it completely obscures the information um, that you might very much want to read. In this case, um, the exact date of birth of somebody who's called Mary Brown was totally obscured, which is kind of unfortunate. But uh, luckily, I knew her husband's exact date of birth and his name, so I did manage to find her. But in another case, I found somebody who was proving quite tricky to track down. And I found him by searching on his exact date of birth and his first name and looking for something that looked like it might just conceivably be his surname, badly mangled in translation. And the, all I could find was one where there was no surname at all. It was just a row of question marks. When I looked at the original, I discovered his surname had once been there, but it was now entirely obscured by an ink blot. 
Um, and that's the sort of thing that can happen. I'm guessing that would be a fairly early one because they started using ball pens later on. But in the days when they were still using nice splurgy fountain pens or dipper pens, um, the ink blot is a, a, a bit of an occupational hazard. So the information you want might be there, but it might be not very readable. And I found a few examples of that where I've had to search using odd little bits of information and then found that the person I want was actually there, but it was completely impossible to read um, at least part of a name um, or something that I'd been searching on and then failed to find them on. That was um, a place just outside Manchester. If I just go to pretty much the other end of the country, um, this is from Gillingham in Kent. And um, I used this because this is very much a, 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 a garrison town. It's very near Chatham Dockyard and lots of military and naval barracks there. And uh, you'll see that a lot of people in this area, they've got connections either with the dockyard or with the armed forces. So you do get quite a lot of sort of military and naval information there, uh, people who work in the dockyard. Um, and this includes you know, repair and maintenance of, of ships. So that's quite interesting, as well as the usual ARP wardens and fire watchers and so forth. And uh, at the bottom of the page, that same page, again, you've got all the murky, horrible sellotape, although it's not obscuring anything too badly. But right down very near the bottom, uh, you have uh, details of someone who's um, in a naval reserve, complete with his number. So the, there's quite a lot of incidental bits of information that you might see. The other thing that you might want to look at is um, each household, as in the census, has a schedule number. And each person within the household has an individual number. And each person's identity card number would be made up of a four letter code, which you see, I'll just go back one, at the top of the page. In this case, this particular bit of Gillingham is DHQS. DHQ is the area code for um, that area, and S denotes an enumeration district. And each household has a unique number within that, and each person within the household, starting at one, has their own number. So everybody's unique identity number would be a four-letter code uh, denoting the enumeration district, um, a number which would be somewhere up to the, the high 200s. Um, there shouldn't be more than 300 households in a district. That would be their um, schedule number and then their own individual number within the household. So the identity cards usually consisted of those three elements. Very, very few places actually had five letter codes, uh, but mostly they're just four. And then two numbers denoting the household and the individual. This is one uh, which is in mercifully nice condition, no sellotape, no really horrible marks on it. But it's an interesting one because this is the military and naval club in Piccadilly. And this is, as you'd expect, full of um, army and navy officers, some of them on active service, some of them retired, some of them working for the Ministry of Defence or the War Office or the Admiralty as it was. Um, and so you get a, a, a return like this, you get a lot of military and naval information, including um, details of somebody who was in Bristol, Gaston, 1916. Um, and one of the people there is actually um, a, a serving officer, but not in the British Army. He's actually in the US Army. So that's a nice example of foreign diplomatic and military personnel who would still be included. Now, that's just a, an overview of what you might expect to find in 39, what's interesting about it, um, what, and what you might not find. Now, I just wanted to finish with something which a lot of people find very interesting, including me, is identity cards. There are an awful lot of these around, and most of the ones you're likely to see, or you may even have still in your family, look like the one right in the middle of the illustration. They're a sort of blue colour, and they've got complicated background printing, they've got serial numbers, and those are the ones that are familiar because um, all of the identity cards were reissued in 1943. The original ones from 1939 looked like the one on the left. They were buff-coloured cardboard with black printing, um, and they were one not easy to forge, they were a lot easier to forge or copy than the blue ones that we're probably more familiar with. Um, there were actually a lot of different kinds of identity cards and lots of different kinds of number series, um, depending on whether it was the original 1939 issue, which theoretically shouldn't be around anymore because they were meant to be handed in for replacements or handed in when people died, 
But in practice, of course, what's supposed to happen and what does happen, again, two different things. So there are a number of these around. We've certainly got samples and documents here at the National Archives. There were some special green identity cards with photographs that were issued to people who needed access to particular secure locations. Uh, there were some buff ones with, pho with photographs in. When the blue ones were issued in 1943, they were issued to adults. Children still had buff coloured cards and then when they um, got to 16, they would get a, um, a, an adult card. And for a while, there were temporary yellow cards for foreign visitors um, and uh, replacement cards where the original one had been lost or stolen. They were a sort of pinkish red. So and I had no idea until I started looking just how many different kinds of identity cards there might be. And finally, once registration was on its way, you have to admire people who can always find a commercial opportunity. As soon as you saw the adverts in the paper saying that national registration is going to take place, um, and this is what, what, what you've got to do. Um, the enterprising people started advertising uh, smart Rexine folders to keep your identity card nice and safe. And this one, which I particularly like, is an identity wristlet um, so that you, you didn't take your card, but you could note down your identity number. And people who needed to get a replaced card uh, because they'd lost it or because their house had burnt down or been bombed and they'd lost the card, um, it was very helpful to the registration authorities if you had a record of the number uh, and they were the people that were described as the ideal losers because if, it, if you at least knew your number um, it made it an awful lot easier for them to track down your records and issue you with a new card and um, you get this this little advert for your you must have an identity wristlet this is all over the place you'll see it in lots and lots of newspapers and newspapers, incidentally, are a terrific source of information and background, what was going on um, during registration and then what happened afterwards. Uh, I touch on some of this in some blog posts that I've written. Uh, again, there are links to that if you really want to look at a, a lot of excruciating detail about identity cards and what people got up to with them and uh, forging them and stealing them and so on. Well, I hope that's you found that helpful and interesting. And if you've got any questions, I'll be handing back to Lauren in a minute. Um, you will lose a video. You won't have to look at me anymore, which is a blessing. Um, and you will also lose sound for a minute. Uh, but then the sound will come back and the next voice you hear it will be Lauren. Uh, meanwhile, thank you very much for listening. Okay, hello everyone, you're back with me, Lauren again. Um, thanks for that, Audrey, it was really interesting. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed the presentation. And we've got absolutely tons of questions um, that have come out as a result of the, the presentation. We'll try and get through as many as you can, uh, as we can. Um, if everyone is happy to stay a little bit past six, we are too, to try and get through those questions. So without further ado, I will just ask the first question. So. How can you prove that a relative has died abroad and therefore should be visible on the register now? That's uh, quite a common one. Um, fortunately, uh, most countries outside England and Wales have got better registration of deaths. So if you've got a death certificate from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, somewhere like that, um, that's probably got enough information to identify the person um, in, in the register. And in fact, quite a number of um, records have already been released, or they're about to, but they've been okay for release on the basis of death certificates from other jurisdictions. Doesn't have to be England and Wales. Um, and as I said, most countries have actually got um, better um, death registration information um, than England and Wales. Excellent. Okay, so the next one was, um, how can you get someone's record opened up if you don't have the exact address? Is it possible? Is that something you might have to go to find my passport? It, it's tricky. Um, it, it's one of those things, if, if before the registers were, were digitised, you wouldn't have had the slightest idea what to do. Now sometimes you, you can work it out. I mean, for example, there is one which I'm going to um, uh, get opened where I, I know who the person is. Uh, I can see the parents who are born over 100 years ago and they're obviously uh, have died and um, their two children well one of them I know is still alive but the other one um, I know has died but I found them because 
I was able to search for the parents and I knew enough about those. As it happened, I also knew the address where they were likely to be. But um, even if I hadn't, if I'd been able to find the parents, um, then I can work out that that person there, whom I know has died, but whose death isn't registered there for whatever reason, um, I will be able to submit the death certificate for that. Unfortunately, there are times when it simply isn't going to be possible. And this is going to be the case, I'm afraid, um, with a lot of the evacuees, where you have absolutely no idea where somebody is likely to be. And when you do a search, you could only see the open records. Um, you know, I, I really, you know, there isn't really a, a, a terrific answer to that because you can't open a record um, without enough information because otherwise you could be um, you know, compromising the, the privacy of somebody who actually is alive. So it is a difficult one, and it's, uh, but it was the, the information commissioner's ruling that the records could be released, but only on condition that records were remained closed until there was, there was proof. So whilst we're on the subject of opening closed records, could you just explain a little bit about the process of how you go about that? So I know some people have asked, said, well, their, re their relatives have been dead for quite some time. Yes, so yeah. how, how do you get that? Yes, if, if you've got um, you know, a, a death certificate, and the, the requirement is a death certificate um, from the, the appropriate jurisdiction, then you can submit that. Now, if you are a, a subscriber to Find My Past, um, you you can submit the a scan of a death certificate to them, and uh, they will forward it to us, and um, we can then check it against the record. And if if it, if it's the right person and if the details match, then we can open the record. If you're not a subscriber to Find My Past, you can still submit the death certificate directly to the National Archives, and uh, there is a charge for that. Um, so you know, if you're a, if you're a Find My Past subscriber, then you can save yourself a bit of money that way. When you've got a full transcription of a household um, as a result of a search, you will see that there is a, a little box that says Update the Record. And if you click on that, you actually have several different options. One of them is to make a correction if there's a transcription error. And um, one of them is to submit a you know, death uh, proof to Find My Past. One is to submit it to us, and there is another one which is the request to, to close a record that is open but you think should be closed. And a couple of questions have come up um, as to missing people on there. Um, I mean, one person's mentioned that they were looking for an address that should be mm. in the record, but when they actually looked for it, it was only um, odd numbers that were present. Or, or Addresses can be is? so very problematic. Um, it, it's a you get all the, the, the problems that you get with, with the census because they, it, it was concerned with recording every individual and the address information was less important. Detailed address information was, was kept at local level. And um, as you get in the census, if, some, if the enumerator has written a street name once and then just dittoed after it, you only get one shot at reading that name. And if it's been written badly, or there may be a few cases where he's, the, the enumerator's forgotten to change the name of the street. Um, you, if you only get one shot at reading that address, and it, it's, it's in a peculiar form, you can effectively lose a whole street. Um, as far as possible, uh, in Find My Past are going to try and tidy that up. Um, but sometimes the format that addresses appear in is very difficult. If you've got a a street that's made up of houses that have names but not numbers, they can be an absolute nightmare because depending on the size of the place, you may only get the name of the house and not the name of the street. And then you've got composite addresses with buildings, um, blocks of flats and mansion flats. Um, the address doesn't fit neatly into the fields. It, it's something that gradually that will improve over time. But sometimes it, it's just down to what's in the original record is, is just um, impossible to interpret. Gradually, with people with local knowledge can say, well, I can find this street and I can't find the street next to it. Um, and we can look at that. We're actually dealing with a query at the moment where somebody's been un unable to find a couple of uh, addresses which are in adjacent streets. And by looking at um, nearby streets, uh, we've been able to now, we, we haven't got to the bottom of this one yet, but um, what we suggest to people is if you, you know, you do your best and you do all the reasonable searches and you look for the address 
uh, look for people that you think are going to be at that address or a nearby one. And if you, you've tried your utmost and you still can't find it, um, a particular street, then if you contact us, if you do that usually through our contact form, then that will eventually come to somebody, quite possibly me, uh, and we will look into it. Sometimes it's it's just, uh, you know, there is, there is no explanation and um, it may be that a, a part of a street or a block of addresses were missed out, the enumerator didn't get them in time. I know there was one case where there was a fire at the enumerator's house and he had to get all the um, get all the household schedules redone, which kind of made him very popular. But it doesn't say how long that took. Now, that's not going to have happened in very many cases, but there will be odd cases where the reason is that something happened to the returns before they were copied up and they had to be done later but it may have been too late to get into the, the, the full register. Um, in, the, in the course of time, you know, there's more and more sort of tidying up and checking being done uh, and things will be uncovered. And uh, you know, if, we, if we go back and do the same searches in a, in a week or a month or a bit longer, then uh, things will be improved. Things can only get better. Um, so um, yeah, do your best. And if it really is, you know, I've tried everything and I'm really good at searching and I still can't find this street and this street, then um, we can look at it for you. What um, might help is if, if you go and search, if you go to the address search tab and you just um, put it, you filter it by the name of the, the urban district, the rural district or whatever, and then hit search, you will get a list of all the streets and all the addresses that are there. And if you see something that looks like a slightly mangled version of the street you're hoping for, that might well be the answer. So that's something I tried with uh, a street that we weren't able to find, and I proved conclusively, no, we've only got eight houses in that street, and there should be more, so that's why we're looking into it. But that's something you can try before you, you actually give in and, and ask us to have a look. Okay, some handy hints there. Um... Is there a guide to deciphering the letter codes that appear in the top left of each image? I know you touched on that in the presentation. The, yeah, the, the area codes, yes. The first three letters are the, the area code, and there is a, a huge, great list, which I just showed you the, the first bit of a TypeScript page. That whole list uh, is on uh, Find My Past. There's always a possibility they'll move things a bit, but currently, if you go into the advanced search on 1939 register, on the right hand side there's a there, there are links to all sorts of useful uh, helpful faqs and things on the site and the very top one is 1939 enumeration districts and that takes you to a huge great long page which is all of the area codes listed by um, alphabetically by code and then also by place so the first three are the area code which are roughly geographical starting with AAA in the City of London and going all the way up to Z. And the fourth letter denotes a particular enumeration district. Uh, and uh, some, it's quite interesting, you know, some people, and I'm one of them, just, just are quite interested in number series and the way things are distributed. And I know that because we get questions about that, and I think they're perfectly sensible questions. Um, is there a guide to the registration of district numbers, and can you search by the district uh, number rather than say an address? You can. You um, the the National Archives catalogue. We've finally got all the um, the, the catalogue piece level detail loaded. The record series is RG one hundred and one, and you can search that by um, enumeration district code. For example, if you put in one of those. Uh, four letter codes uh, as your search, as an exact search term in RG101. That would take you to the, you know, the, the, the bit of RG101 that, that covered that town, that area. Um, and once you've identified a particular piece, then you, you can use that as your reference search. Um, the, the reference search uh, on, the, on, on Find My Past, well, you'll find that on the, uh, the, the, the name search page, which is the, the main one. Uh, is a piece number, which is um, four, four, four numbers and a letter, because there are, there are nearly 65,000 of these, so uh, very unusually for National Archives, we have a letter code as part of the piece number, because otherwise they would just be stupidly high. So a piece number is four numbers and a letter, 
and then the what they call item number is actually a page within the, the book. Um, so you, you can search by that. So you can look at our catalogue and you can browse through the areas and get a feel for it that way. And you can also look at the, the, the three letter area codes, um, which is a, a, a slightly shorter way of, of, of becoming familiar with them. Uh, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, I think it does. <laughs> um, just a couple more um, about who was actually mentioned in the uh, in the 1939 register. So you've got a couple of people uh, asking whether children were um, and whether homeless people were registered. <coughs> yes, children were, and everybody had to have their identity card and their ration book. Um, so children were there, although in the case of um, evacuees, they can be tricky to find because they're not going to be with their parents and they might not be somewhere where you expect them to be. Um, children were evacuated in early September, but an awful lot of them didn't stay in the areas where they were originally evacuated to. After Dunkirk, children have been evacuated to, um, to south coast resorts and thereabouts. A lot of them were then moved much further inland, so they might start off in Dorset, but then uh, you know, a year or so later, they'll be in, in, in Shropshire or somewhere like that. So there was an awful lot of moving about. And uh, they did, although you can't search by this, they did make provisions so that um, the, the, the National Register itself would have a linkage between the, the, the numbers of the, the identity card numbers of the children who had been evacuated and their parents back home uh, so that they could keep track of you know, who belonged to who. Um, but theoretically, all, all of the children should be there. And homeless people, apart from the people in things like the Salvation Army hostels, um, there were special forms, which they weren't enumeration books. They looked like, if anybody who's old enough to remember them, checkbooks. Um, they were you know, booklets full of forms with counterfoils. And these were what we used for uh, finding the people who were literally homeless, uh, the people who were sleeping rough. Um, in practice, not very many of these were used, um, but again, if you look at the newspapers, you do find uh, stories of, um, in, in subsequent months and years, people who were sort of vagrants and tramps and you know, gentlemen of the road being hauled up in court for not having um, an identity card because they managed not to get themselves registered. Or in one case, someone who'd got an identity card, but it wasn't his. He'd lost his and he found another one lying around. Uh, and he knew he needed a card to get into a, a Salvation Army hostel, so he just turned up with this one. Uh, the fact that it wasn't his didn't seem to um, register with him. He was, um, he was given a slap on the wrist. I don't think he was severely punished. But nearly everybody, um, even tramps and vagrants, got registered at some point. OK, and this one's quite a good one, because I know we were talking about this yesterday. Were there any checks on to confirm the information that was being given, or could someone lie about the name? Oh, um, there is no record of, at all um, that somebody hasn't told a lie in. And um, so sometimes it would be fairly obvious up front. I mean, if you've got enumerators who know their area, and they were very small areas, so they might well be personally known to the people. So sometimes if, for example, a mother was trying to understate in her son's age so, so that he wouldn't get called up, or if somebody was giving a wrong information, um, they, you know, they might check up. But an awful lot of this didn't come out until much later. And I think the thing that Lauren was referring to is we have a wonderful case. Uh, it was actually a criminal prosecution in 1945 when somebody was fined... Um, considerable sum of money for stealing, I think, four shillings worth of meat. Now, that seemed like a severe punishment. Uh, when you look at the case, what he actually did was, um, prior to registration night, he deliberately falsified the returns, and he created five completely false identities uh, to a couple in his own household, which were versions of his own daughter's names, and then um, he added a, he got his, um, his mistress to add a completely fictitious inhabitant to the flat that he'd set her up in. Um, and then he also created two totally bogus identities based on names um, of, of people that she was related to, but with made up birth dates. And um, basically, he had been collecting rations 
uh, for these five entirely fictitious people and getting away with it for five years, hence a fairly severe penalty. And he was probably quite lucky not to end up in jail, um, partly because he was not, not ancient, but he was a little bit on the elderly side. Um, but there certainly were uh, a, a number of prosecutions because people who um, are dishonest and try to get away with stuff, they're quite often not that good at it. And they, they either get careless or they, 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 they don't plan it properly in the first place. And um, I mentioned newspapers were a very good source, and they really are. If you just browse through newspapers, do key searches like national registration, prosecution, you will find lots and lots uh, of, of people um, not so often falsifying information, but misusing somebody else's card, um, hanging on to the card of somebody who's died and continuing to claim their rations, or deserters from the army and the navy um, obviously couldn't use their army identification or would be picked up instantly. So they would often um, steal uh, or borrow somebody else's card uh, and quite a number of them got caught. Actual forgeries were comparatively rare because that takes quite a lot of time and trouble, but there certainly were some of those as well. So where, where there are records being created, there's always going to be somebody who's going to find the angle, who's going to find the way of scanning it uh, and, and turning it into money. And um, I haven't been looking for very long and I've already found quite a few. So in answer to that question, yes. So I can absolutely <laughs> lie about their name and the, and oh, the yeah. registration. Um, one final one um, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, you mentioned the uh, late registrations, those who've got, who missed the official mm. deadline. Do we know if A, they survive and B, will they also be put online at some stage or have there no plans at the moment? <laughs> Right, well, yes, they would survive. If somebody got registered, then the register was kept and was, like this register, it was continually updated. Uh, there were a number of different registers. There was the birth register, obviously, for the people who were born after registration night. There was something called the P register, which was people arriving in the country. Um, that, I gather, wasn't kept up for very long because then it was amalgamated into a sort of general composite current register, which was people coming out of the armed forces, um, the people arriving from overseas, people who needed a replacement card for whatever reason, and then the people who were just such terrible backsliders, they were registering incredibly late for some reason or other. Um, and all of those separate registers, as well as um, a separate, a demob register, which was set up in 1945 when people were being demobbed from the forces, in, obviously in huge numbers, all of those registers together com uh, comprised what became known as the central register. Um, unfortunately, there are as yet no plans to digitise any of that, uh, but we never know. Um, great, thank you, Audrey. I think that's all we've got time for. I know there's been a couple more questions that we haven't been able to answer. If that is the case, please do get in touch via our contact form. Um, I think Emily will post the link to that now. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, we'll be making a recording of today's um, a session available for download in due course, so please do keep an eye on the National Archives website. Um, finally, um, there are some uh, the PowerPoint and a list of useful links in the Documents tab uh, just below the chat box, which you can access and download, which you might find helpful. Um, and as webinars are a new venture for us, we're really keen to receive audience feedback on both the subject covered and the functionality of the technology. So please do get in touch to let us know your thoughts and you can do that via the what's on email address which is whats.on at nationalarchives.gsi.gov.uk um, You will also be receiving a feedback survey to complete um, in addition to the PowerPoint and we would really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill that out in the next couple of days as it will be a huge value to us when planning any future webinars. So thank you again um, and on that note I'll say goodbye. Thank you.